to explore the hidden site of the glacial Arctic Ocean. We load up in an hour at 4 p.m., and that's it. Don't forget anything. Then we're on our way. 176, that's a lot. I'm Guilin, the one who started this crazy project. I can take a little. That's Manu, the only woman on the team. That's Alban, with the red cross on his cap, always cheerful. As for Sam, he's sort of our genius handyman. The other four, Clément, Benoit, Pascal and Vincent, are all experts. Mountain climber, photographer, emergency medic, cameraman, and last of all, kayak, our bear detector. I can't tell who's who because we're all dressed the same. For Manu and me, this flight towards the pole is the accomplishment of two years' work. In this no man's land, the pilots eventually find a safe landing site. Then we are dropped off on the frozen ocean at 40 nautical miles, roughly 70 kilometers from the geographic North Pole. Valentine is our logistics expert. She's heading for Resolute Bay to take charge of base camp. She'll be in touch with us daily through the satellite phones. DC-3 leaving without us, how I've dreamt of this. Not one familiar mark to guide us. Ahead of us, due south, 800 kilometers of ice field to cross before reaching land. Our main objective, to do about 50 dives between the pole and the Canadian coast. What I suggest is that we take it easy, don't rush, take all the time you need to get ready. We have to be careful and watch out for frostbite. Rule number one, as soon as some part of your body feels extremely cold, you say so. Hands, eyebrows, cheeks, whatever. So do whatever's left to be done, and when we're all ready, we start off. Okay, Kayak, let's go. He traveled with us all the way from France. Taking our young husky along was no easy matter. This apparently motionless ocean is an immense ice field that drifts according to winds and sea currents above a depth of 4,000 meters. The first kilometer confirms that all the training in the world will never give you the feel of the real terrain. From now on, the sun will stop setting. My hands feel terribly cold, and I know this isn't always going to be easy, but it's my responsibility to bring everyone back safe and sound. It's cold. I feel something. Yeah, but you still have to be super careful. How is it? It hurts. Well, that's a good sign. But it's still numb, and I've been at it for five minutes already. Give it a good rub with your hands. Yeah, I tried that. It worked pretty well. Yeah, that's what you should do. Now we have to get our bearings. See, it just takes a little while. Well, it served as a good warning. So, it's cold. We're complaining about the cold. In a month and a half, when it gets hot, we'll be all wet. We'll complain about the heat. Let's just concentrate on getting some sleep now. When we woke up this morning, we all felt groggy, as if we'd been anesthetized by the cold. It was minus 40 degrees Celsius last night inside the tent, but no one really wants to make a big deal of it. We're getting into a daily routine. The University of Alberta asked us to take some measurements. 
The only way to evaluate the thickness of the field, which the satellites are unable to detect, is to measure it on the spot. It's March 29th. This morning, it's precisely minus 39 degrees centigrade as Manu and Albon get ready. I'm happy to give them the privilege of the first dive under the pole. The inflows are set at minimum. I tighten them. They're at minimum and they stay that way. If you open it, it's because you need more air. Are they good and tight? As tight as possible for a minimum amount of air to avoid any frost. Good, because the joint is going to be very cold. I figured out why it took so much effort. It's because they're frozen. Go ahead. Go on. I can't breathe. You've got to warm it up with the heat gun or it's impossible. Well, I can't say it's too comfortable. Let's try it again. Go for it. Uh, one, two, three. Bravo! The feet feel okay. All right, I feel great. The spit freezes right away. You okay, Manu? I unfroze it a little while ago, no problem. Okay. Making my way into this formidable world is a bit frightening. The water is so clear it makes me dizzy. It feels like I'm floating weightless in space. The lifeline is all that connects me to the surface. I've never held on to it as tight as at this instant. Above, they have no idea of what I'm going through. In this mineral world, we never expected to come across any traces of life so soon, barely out of the polar night. Perhaps the first rays of the sun awakened this school of krill. The ice is bright, the cold biting, the shards are razor sharp. Despite the frost in the mask, I can see blocks of ice crystals appearing. A shrimp trapped inside one seems to be waiting for a ray of sun to release it from its icy abode. Oh, 
Yes, there are enormous crystals. The colors are extraordinary. Blue, turquoise, white, it's stunning. The visibility, the clarity of the water, it's amazing. We really get an eyeful, so many wonderful things to see that we'll have to come back tomorrow. We always dive two or three people at a time, just as we do in cave diving, and we double up on vital equipment, regulators, tanks. The teams take turns at each site. Sam has gone to measure the temperature of underwater ice. Seawater in the Arctic generally freezes at about minus 1.8 degrees centigrade, depending on its salt concentration. The temperature of the ice on the surface is much colder, closer to air temperature. Minus 1.6 degrees is water temperature, and minus 1.7 is ice temperature. I'm giving you my jacket. I'm okay. My gel off, my tights. It's okay, I feel good. <laughs> I'm okay. We continue our way south through the whiteness of the day. Compared to regular expeditions, we carry a lot of weight. Tanks, compressors, a generator, fuel, a heat gun to warm up the diving equipment, all the essential technology reduced to an absolute minimum. We had planned to cover an average of 12 to 15 kilometers a day. Because of the wind, it's drifting at a rate of uh, 0 0.3, 0 0.4 kilometers an hour. We're advancing at an average speed of one kilometer per hour. We've gone 6.5 kilometers in six and a half hours after all that effort. Let's not spend too much time on this damn ice pack. We still have to keep pulling the sleds. Oh my God, wow, that big chunk just turned over. It turned over? Yeah. Oh yeah, I didn't know that could happen. If you'd been on it just then. Bad luck. Okay, let's go. The first leads appear. To negotiate these channels is exhausting. We rapidly understand it will take an immense team effort to overcome these obstacles and continue on, but no one complains. Dinner! The simplest gestures accomplished in a temperate zone take considerably more time here. 
It takes an hour to melt enough snow for our cooking and water consumption. That's why I always carry energy bars. We're going from minus 35 degrees to minus 20 degrees. It'll cost us. We lost 13 millibars yesterday. And since then, we went from 1,038 millibars to 1,002. Which means if it's less than minus 30 degrees tomorrow, our clothes will be freezing. And it'll be chaos on the ice field. We're ready for it. Just a mess. We lose too much time morning and evening, especially in the morning. This morning we left one hour and 15 minutes too late. There are always two to four people who slip out of the tents after the others and it makes us late. Our timing is completely off, so no lounging around in the morning. I'm just like you. I don't feel like getting out of my sleeping bag either. I'd like to stay in another 15 minutes or so, too. So, whatever it takes, departure time is 9 a.m. We'll try to be ready by 9. We all have to be ready by 9, and that's that. We have to stop losing so much time. We keep losing time, and that's a problem. We just cannot afford to. Could you explain what you're doing with that little bottle? First, I pee into it. Then I check to make sure it's closed tight. I tip the bottle over to make absolutely sure. And then? Then I put it against my feet. I don't believe it. You keep it on you like that? Sure. When I feel a cold, it's like a hot water bottle and it warms me up. We've lost Michons. <laughs> Ah, good night, then. Despite a heavy lateral wind, we still maintain our course southward. Ten years ago, there used to be multi-year ice here that was several meters thick. Today, there is only young ice that's never more than a meter and a half thick, which is easily deformed by the winds and ocean currents. The old ice has almost entirely disappeared, a sign that the ocean will soon be completely free of ice in the summer. Sometimes I feel a little lonely. I haven't told them, but we lost five kilometers yesterday because of the drift. We've got to get over the ridge and onto some good pack ice. We won't make it before seven. It's better to go back 200 meters and knock off at 6.30. Or we knock off at seven and get up at 10. We can sleep an extra hour. It's up to us to get organized and keep moving. If we didn't have to cross this thing, I wouldn't mind. But it's going to be very difficult. And I think this is a really bad time to do it. He's right, I don't feel good about it. This way is slowing us down even more. We can't go around the lead. It'll take us too far east. We'll have to go across. I think we should use the rafts. We don't have much choice. Yeah. We'll slide them in there, from where it's easier to step in, and then we cross where there's the least ice in the water. It shouldn't tip forward too much. No, no, we'll keep it centered. Good. It's well balanced like that. Perfect. Let go, let go. I could use a paddle. You have to have sailing skills if you go to the pole. Hope there's no submarine about to surface.
Bring another ref to help them out. One, two, three. Easy, easy. What I didn't know was that at that very moment, at base camp in Resolute Bay, Valentin was consulting maps and satellite images and starting to worry about our slow progress. Then she discussed it with Wayne Davidson, a prominent polar meteorologist who has lived here for 30 years. They're too loaded down to make it to the coast. The ice conditions are the worst I've ever seen. With what they're hauling, they should have left much earlier. The ice conditions would be bad for anybody, no matter how light they traveled. Uh, everything is changing. The temperature will be more comfortable for them, but ice conditions will get worse. The ice is going to start moving more and more, and it will be difficult for them to get very far. What do you see from up there? It's a mess. Chaos everywhere. There are several compression crests that look like super diving sites. Right, Sam? We have to go down and see if the ice isn't too thick to drill a hole. Exactly. It will take us four hours to travel one kilometer to the good ice where we camp tonight. chilly, I'd say. How about my back? Luckily, we're in good spirits. It's funny, but the brush turns out to be the best polar tool there is. The beauty of a gesture repeated over and over. Morning and night, it can take as much as two hours to brush off the icicles formed from our breathing and sweat, as well as the frost in the tents and sleeping bags. Valentine? Hi, Valentine, it's Guilain. So we're at 88.19.47 and 48.32.06. Okay, you've drifted pretty far south. We walked too, 5.63 kilometers southward. It was quite cold, beautiful, but cold. This morning it was minus 40. It's chaos on the ice field. We're making very slow progress. Tomorrow? There's a violent blizzard heading your way at an incredible speed. In the afternoon, you can expect winds at 20 to 30 knots. So Wayne suggests you get settled on good pack ice and build walls of snow and ice to protect yourselves. It's going to be extremely violent. Valentin wasn't kidding. Violent is definitely the word. Rather than keeping warm under the covers, Alban, Sam, Manu and I get up the nerve and give it a try anyway. It's opening up. And closing too. It's starting to close up. One thing for sure, we can't go too far. Could you get through from where you are? Uh, 
You okay? Uh -huh. yeah, that yeah, but it sure there. is thick. As the first site was predominantly flat and angular with sharp crystals, here it's like the shock of the titans. The packs and crests seem to tumble over each other as in a ballet of petrified giants. The underwater relief is eight times what's visible on the surface. Like frozen cumulonimbus clouds, the word exploring takes on a new meaning for us. In the Middle Ages, sailors feared this sea more than anything, a sea of darkness where they risked reaching the edge and falling over. Here we have clearly fallen into another world, as demonstrated by this giant salt concretion, a new sort of icicle. We decide to explore even further and penetrate into the heart of the labyrinth. A maze of hollows, one narrower than the other. We stay alert for the slightest shift of the ice packs, listening for the smallest creak. Are those my heartbeats that I'm hearing? We continue down to 40 meters, like arctic manta rays sliding through an abyssal void. Let me see your face. Do it some more. Is it better, Guilain? Not too close. Better. Just like it came out of a swimming pool. That's what happened to me yesterday. Am I very white? A little, but the color's coming back. You really have to rush out of that water. And when you come out into a blizzard that's whipping into your face... Yeah, you have to go fast. There, it's getting back to normal. That's all yeah. We shouldn't be faced with this type of terrain so soon. It isn't really water or really ice. It's too dangerous to venture out on. You got through. 
but all seven of us won't make it. No, the idea is that I take a rope and pull you over. I'll trace a way through and you float across. It's ideal. Or go alongside it. That's going too far out of our way. It's much shorter to go this way. Okay, so somebody puts on a wetsuit, breaks through, the others follow with the rafts. The wetsuit will do the trick. The problem is that it's frozen when we get into it. Okay? Yep. I go in this direction? Yes. Albon has to cover 300 meters this way. It's not every day you see a human icebreaker. I should have tied it better. Careful not to lose the rope. Right arm. Don't drop the rope. It's gonna kill him. Meanwhile, get the sleds ready because we're following right behind him. And sometimes, if I insist, we push through like this. It's because all this has been slowing us down, along with that damn drift that's working against us. Hi, everybody. Good morning. <laughs> You okay? Yeah, I'm fine. Sleep well? Yeah, yeah. So did I. Thanks for asking. By now, we've all adjusted to camp life. We each fill out our daily physiological chart for the study on sleep patterns and physical exertion under extreme conditions. It's time for your pill. Another study consists of swallowing a nanotechnological capsule which records our body temperature even during the dives. Okay. Is it rising? Yeah, 34 degrees. Is there a microchip in it? That's right. Check this at the end of the dive to make sure it's working. Okay. While Sam once again tends to a defective compressor, others get busy recharging batteries, filling tanks, and opening a window onto the ocean. Sort of an airlock for aquanauts. Eleven, ten, nine. We have ignition sequence start. The engines are on. Four, three, two, one, zero. A dive under the Arctic is certainly worth a spacewalk. That's one small step for man, one giant leap for mankind. I think of Neil Armstrong and Buzz Aldrin coming out of their lunar module when they first set foot on the moon 
discovering totally unknown surroundings, like the upside down world that's around us. We've walked under the pole. It's like a sea of mercury or liquid nitrogen. While Sam gets ready for his takeoff, Benoit and I celebrate our 40th dive of the month. Let's continue right side up, with our feet on the ground, as they say. In one of the canyons, life comes towards us. It's like encounters of the third kind. Here's an amphipod, just released from the ice. There's the cryopelagic arctic cod, Arctogadus glacialis. The world's most boreal fish exists all on its own within the layers of ice. To complete the picture, a narcomedusa jellyfish, a very rare specimen, observed only at 2,000 meters by robotic submarines until now. When we finally come across the undisputed resident of these waters, Sam looks like a giant next to it, a sea angel. It is the living image of the Arctic in all its beauty and fragility. It's like a vision of unknown galaxies, or like the creation of the world, a stenophore, Beroe Cucumis, seems to be attracted by us. Like a cosmic vessel from the abyss, Mertensia ovum, with rainbow-colored filaments, illuminates the ocean. To be honest, I'll do all I can to find an extra heat gun, but it's Easter weekend and I can't even find any scotch tape. I'll try everything, but don't count on it. No more planes are flying in. It's complicated here. Thanks for the good work, Val. Talk to you tomorrow. Bye. Returning to reality, it's the first provisioning drop scheduled. We're overjoyed at the sight of the DC-3 flying overhead. We're back in touch with civilization. But the pilots get to go home. OK, that's very fun. Thank you. We are waiting for the rest of the reshooting. Thank you very much. No problem. We're just inbound on our second drop. Well done, DC-3. It's perfect for us. We have 500 kilos to divide up. There doesn't seem to be any damage due to the drop. Thank 
So what have you got, Manu? Well, this is apparently from Sandy. Oh, I'm sorry, it's for kayak. <laughs> That's okay, we'll eat it. Oh, this looks good. A roblochon cheese. Some fruit salad, I think. I think this is the last of it. We love you very much. It turned out to be a pretty good day. By the way, we've drifted southeast 581 meters. Southeast. We're headed home. Hold on tight. When we start off four days later, our load is still very heavy. The leads are more and more frequent. The cracks are getting wider. We should have gone more than 300 kilometers by now, but we've only managed half of that. We're not moving forward anymore. That day, I decided to talk to the team. It's important to do as many dives as possible to lighten the weight we're hauling. That way, we'll be using up a lot of the naphthalene, a fuel that doesn't freeze. Other than progressing south, our main goal is still to explore the hidden side of this ocean. Got anything you want to dry? I think Ilan had something. So I spoke to Valentine tonight and got the latest report. As you can see, the ice field is in bad shape. We're not advancing as fast as we'd hoped. At the rate we're going and figuring our distance from the coast, it's highly unlikely we'll reach the coast. So we're going to reorient the expedition. And we'll probably be evacuated off the ice field by plane in 10 to 15 days from now, if the weather and the ice conditions allow. So much for the conditions, they're not getting any better. It's breaking up. Be quiet and listen. It's incredible. The pack ahead of us is starting to rise. There, where you see the cracks. The ice is softening, melting, disintegrating. The sharp rectilinear forms have disappeared. For the first time, the melt is being observed from underneath the ocean. It's daunting to think that we're living on top of it and that a plane has to land on this to get us out. The salt concretions explode and dissolve into the ocean.
We hear the ice packs overturn and collide. It sounds like the world is coming to an end. The algae appear everywhere now. Life returns, microorganisms colonize every square centimeter of the ice field. It's the beginning of the end, and all too soon. The temperature of the underwater ice is increasing dangerously, minus 1.4 degrees. It's the sign that our expedition is over. That looks like it might be OK. Look over there, it's breaking up. There's a solid pack that leads over there. Yes. Yeah, look, there's a solid pack that leads over there. It goes to the other side of the lead. Yeah, but we have to keep an eye on it. Yes, because the wind is picking up. Tell them we can hear the cracking at night. We can feel the jolts through our mattresses and sleeping bags. It's like an earthquake. There's a very loud cracking sound, as if it's breaking up, as if all the tension is being released all of a sudden. It's astonishing. It cracked open, shifted, then formed again to the left around the camp. So now there are big ridges and many leads that are getting wider. OK. okay. Big hugs. Talk to you tomorrow. We're too far from the coast. The water is increasing. From Resolute, Valentin and Wayne confirm that conditions are getting very risky for a plane to land on the ice field. We know exactly where they are, right there. 46, 46, 46. What's that all around them? To the right, there are two leads. One of them may be opening, but we need confirmation. There's a lot of water out there, all right, and a lot of movement going on. Yes. That's what they said, and also that yesterday they felt an enormous jolt. That doesn't surprise me at all. It must be hard to take with all that going on, but it doesn't mean they have to evacuate immediately. Isn't it dangerous? Not too dangerous if it's only the first day. But it's been going on for two days already. Then that's two days too many. Look, that's where we were a little while ago. It's clear that the ice has been breaking up rapidly over the last two days, and we both agree that you're running a great risk. So they're waiting for our decision. When do they want an answer? Tomorrow morning at the latest. So the pilot and the others have been in conference all afternoon. And the situation has changed since today's news bulletin. We have to give them an answer by tomorrow. When would we fly out? They're aiming for Saturday. That all depends on the weather. Well, as soon as possible. So, it's all going to be over. No doubt about it. It's over already.
It's heartbreaking to have to leave so soon. If only we could have stayed a few weeks longer. In the end, we only covered 170 of the 800 kilometers we had planned. But it was worth it. I remember, when we arrived at the pole a month and a half ago, in the bitter cold, I said to myself, it's going to be hell, but it's too late. There's no turning back. Now that we've learned to live on the surface of this ocean, I realize it's been heaven, and returning won't be easy. I also realize that we've been witness to a world that's coming to an end.